to Old Man Metal's Musings, the official podcast of Old Man Metal. Old Man Metal's Musings is a proud part of the Rat Style Review Network. And now, without further ado... Hey, this is Old Man Metal. Hope everyone's doing well, and welcome to the 13th episode of Old Man Metal's Musings, the official podcast of Old Man Metal. Today we're going to look at something that we haven't touched on yet, and that's fountain pens. Specifically, we're going to look at fountain penning on the cheap by attempting to jailbreak an empty disposable Pilot Varsity, which is this rascal right here, and then we're going to try to re-ink it rather than throwing it away. So thank you for joining me today, and thanks to everyone who watched the 12th episode. That was my top five EPs of 2020 show. 2020 was the year of the EP, so that show is chock full of great metal, and a lot of it was debut material from new bands, so please check it out if you haven't seen it. As always, I want to give a shout out to AJ Nemesis for the theme music. That's a song called Through the Electric Mist. AJ is a great guitarist and an all-around great guy, and he's on Spotify now, so I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes, along with the link to his YouTube channel, so please go check him out. So you've probably noticed that I'm using a new background. I finally got bored with the old one and decided to change things up. That's one of the advantages of shooting on a green screen, and I decided to go with something with a view this time. The new background has some tricks up its sleeve, so to speak, and I talk about that briefly on a recent video short, so go check that out if you haven't seen it. This is also the first episode to use the new overhead camera, which I tested a while back in another video short. Um, that was back in December, so it's nice to finally use the camera for something. Moving on to the beer. Today's show beer is Hop, Drop, and Roll from Noda Brewing Company in Charlotte, North Carolina. And that is this rascal right here. Noda is named for the North Davidson neighborhood in Charlotte, where they opened their first 15-barrel brew house in 2011, uh, becoming one of Charlotte's first craft breweries in the process. Hop, Drop, and Roll debuted in October 2013 and took the gold at the World Beer Cup six months later. It's a 7.2% West Coast-style IPA brewed with a base of four different malts, including Victory and Wheat, and it's hopped in 10 separate editions with Citra, Amarillo, Centennial, Warrior, and Chinook. Based on that hot bill, you'd expect a lot of florals and bright citrus and bitter pine, and you'd be right about that. But there's also an unusual set of melon notes that sets hop, drop, and roll apart flavor-wise, and there's some nice grassiness to boot, which I always like in IPAs. In true West Coast IPA style, the finish is dry and fairly clean, and there's a nice resinous pine bitterness that sticks around for a while afterwards. Hop, Drop, and Roll is currently ranked at number 33 in the American IPA category on Beer Advocate, so I'm not the only one who thinks it's a great beer. And get, get a pour of this rascal here. And like most of these wonderful... IPAs nowadays, it comes in a pint. Oh God, that's so good. Moving on to the subject at hand, which is fountain pens. Um, why fountain pens is probably a whole episode in itself, so I'm going to skip that question for now. What are fountain pens is probably a whole episode too, but it's a little bit easier to summarize. Let's try. Fountain pens were a major technological advancement over the older dip pen design. They employ a self-contained reservoir of ink to keep the nib fed, which eliminates the need for constantly dipping the pen in ink. The idea dates back to the 900s, and it's believed that Leonardo da Vinci constructed and used an early fountain pen around the turn of the 16th century. Initial patents in the early 1800s led to a frenzied period of development in the invention of hard rubber, the development of the iridium-tipped gold nib, and the advent of free-flowing ink all led to increasing commercial production in the 1850s and mass production by the 1880s. The turn of the 20th century saw the advent of fountain pens using a variety of new filling mechanisms and new designs to stop leakage, which was a big problem with earlier pens. 
Fountain pens retained their dominance through the 40s and 50s, but the ballpoint design, first patented in the late 1880s, began to gain ground in the late 1930s thanks to game-changing advancement by the Bureau brothers. They solved the biggest problems with existing ballpoint designs by developing viscous, fast-drying ink that eliminated smudging while providing controlled flow through their newly patented ball and socket mechanism. These advancements completely changed the commercial potential of the ballpoint pen, and by the 1960s, continued improvements in mass production allowed the ballpoint to finally eclipse the fountain pen in popular usage. Fountain pen anatomy is pretty straightforward. Non-viscous water-soluble ink is held in a reservoir and flows by capillary action through the feed. The feed controls the flow of ink to the nib and, just as importantly, allows air to flow back into the reservoir, providing a smooth, burp-free stream of ink. The ink then flows down between the tines, down the slit, to the tip of the nib, where it's transferred to the paper. Ink itself is obviously a big part of the equation, and that's probably a whole other episode in itself, so I'm just going to say that today I'm going to use Noodler's Black if I can get the Varsity open, and that's this stuff right here. And I'm also going to say that Noodler's Black is my go-to ink because it's washproof, it's medium wet, so it works well in a wide range of pens, and it's well behaved on less expensive paper, which is what I typically write on. Plus, it's $12.50 for a 3-ounce bottle, and that's really, really affordable for fountain pen ink. As far as the Pilot Varsity goes, I bought it out of morbid curiosity to see how bad a $3 fountain pen really could be. And if I'm honest, which I am, it actually wasn't bad for 3 bucks. So it ended up sitting around the kitchen, getting used for grocery lists, random things like that, and it finally ran out of ink, and rather than throw it away, I'm going to try to re-ink it. Not that I'm cheap or anything. So, let's see what we can do with these. So, this is the rascal that we're looking at right here. Pilot Varsity. We'll take a look at it on the overhead. And it is made of a couple of different parts. Like uh, all fountain pens, it's got a cap, which in this case is just um, cheap molded plastic, which is uh, what you're going to use because it's a disposable, so you're not going to use anything that costs a lot of money. And then uh, all the other normal fountain pen parts, you've got the nib right here, which is what does the writing down here at the tip. And then back behind the nib is the feed. And then back behind that is the body of the pen. Uh, and in this case, the body of the pen is hollow and they just fill it with ink. And there's no way to refill it because it's disposable. And obviously that's what we're tackling today. So you've got a reservoir full of ink and the ink gets pulled up through the feed uh, via capillary action. And then the nib is actually over top of the end of the feed and it uh, continues to pull ink out. The ink gets pulled out into the nib by capillary action and uh, delivered to the writing surface. So if you look you can see the nib is actually slit and it's dirty because I haven't cleaned it since it ran out of ink. Um, but the nib is slit and that's where the ink gets carried up between uh, the, through that slit up to what's called the tines and you're probably not going to be able to see them. Oh, but the tines are these parts here. And uh, the ink goes out to the end of the tines and feeds onto the paper. And you can see, get a little bit of ink on my thumb because, like I said, I didn't clean it after it ran dry. And you can see there's actually still a little bit of ink up in there, which that's perfectly cool. So, the other thing I noticed about it, I'll point out, I didn't notice this until it was uh, just about out of ink, but there's a, an ink window there. It's a clear part where you can look and see if you rotate it to that part of the pen where the name is, you can see how much ink there is left in it. And looking at this thing, is obvious it actually holds a whole heck of a lot of ink relative to what you typically uh, fill into a fountain pen. So, that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to get this thing apart. There's a couple of ways we can go about it. Um, so this end down here is, uh, as you can see, a press fit cap. And um, so obviously what they've done is that's where they've inked it in production. Um, if they didn't need that port to ink it, 
and uh, then they would have just made that whole uh, that whole body solid. There would be a lot easier to make it one solid molded piece versus having uh, the end cap on there. So, um, and that end cap actually, you can't see it probably, but it rotates. And the fact that it rotates tells me that it's press fit in there with a flange and it would seem to be obvious that that's the place that we would attack this thing if we wanted to ink it would be to ink it the same way that they ink it in production but i'm not so sure that's the way to do it because if they've got this thing pressed in there but it's still rotating like it is then that means that they've got a, a flange system in there a barb system that goes in and expands and holds it in place and i'm betting if i were to pry this piece out um, I would not be able to get it back in there in such a way that it wouldn't leak. So I'm not going to do that as my primary route of attack. And what I'm talking about, I'll show this little rascal here. This is a, a fitting that's made to fill a hole when you put uh, freezers together, big industrial freezers. A lot of times they come in panels that you put together and there are holes in the panels where you get to the screw latches to latch them together and then you have to go back and fill those holes with something so that um, cold freezing air is not getting into the panels themselves because then you get ice in the panels and have all sorts of other little problems so they make these little things that you press in there and it's sort of got what I'm talking about you can see that it's a flanged thing that fits down in there and once it fits in there it clicks into place and if you then go to try to pry it out, you're liable to tear that lip up. And um, in the case of a fountain pen that's holding ink, that would probably be less than good. So the second part of it that they have to put together is putting the nib in the feed in. And typically on a fountain pen, the nib and the feed will insert together um, there's different ways. Uh, usually they're friction fit or press fit and um, usually they go in together and then you can just remove them together. And I don't know how easy that's going to be to do on this one. If you look there, they've got this odd little locking ring up front. Um, and then if you look, there's another, I don't know if you can really tell that that's what it is, but there's another one of those locking rings back here. And so I don't know if possibly there's some sort of system barbary or something that when you push this in place, locks it into place. And if that's the case, then yanking that's going to be a bitch. Um, but that's what I'm going to try to do as my first route of attack. Because like I said, I don't want to, um, I don't think taking this end cap off is going to work. So that's what I'm going to do. And we're going to see what happens. And we're going to zoom our camera the other way the correct way and um so i've got a little rubber gripper here the first thing i'm going to do is just try to grab this thing and yank it out and a lot of times on a normal fountain pen if you're changing nibs or swapping the nib or taking the nib out to adjust it that's what you would be able to do oh that bear is good so i don't know what's going to happen we're going to find out I haven't done any research on this on the web to find out how you take these things apart or if anyone else has tried to do it because that would take all the fun out of it. So I have absolutely no idea how this is going to go. Um, it might work. It might not work. But we're, like I said, going to try. Oh, look at that. Just pull right out. And pull it the rest of the way out. And I'm going to try not to get ink all over my nice white work surface. And you can see there's still some, definitely some liquid ink in there. So what I'm going to have to do now is cut and clean this thing up. Because one of the things that you learn with fountain pens is inks often do not agree with each other. And the residue from one ink can mess you up if you're changing to another ink. So we don't want to do that. So I got that in there. So the next thing I'm going to do is do a really good job of cleaning everything up. And that whole unit just popped right out. So that's the nib and the feed. It's one unit. Um, and maybe we'll take a little bit closer look at it here. 
more of this stuff off here. I got my nice white work surface here. I don't want to mess that up if I can help it. It's just a piece of poster board, but if I can use it a few times before I have to replace it, then that's so much the better. And I am just psyched about how easily that came out. I figured this was going to be a ginormous pain in the ass because they've got a vested interest in this thing not being easy to take apart and re-ink. It's disposable. It's three bucks. The way they're making their money is you throw it away and you buy another one. They're not making their money up front selling you a $30, 50 100 $200 fountain pen. Um, so I sort of had it in my mind that, that this was actually going to be a failure of a little project and it wasn't going to work because I figured they would have this thing buggered up to where you can't take it apart and re-ink it. Um, so actually really psyched to see that that's not the case. And that's the hard part right there. Um, the rest of this should be easy peasy. One thing about working with fountain pens is you really quickly get used to the fact that you just have ink all over your hands. There's just nothing you can do about that. So we're going to zoom in here, take a little bit closer look at this little unit we've got here. Can we zoom and get a good zoom there. Will that work? So it's just one unit. And if you look, the you can tell from the way this, these clips are down here that that nib just clips on, slides on to uh, some guide rails on the feed there. And that's actually how the nibs go on a Lamy Safari. Um, it's not exactly like that, but it's a real similar type thing. Usually a nib will come much further back onto the feed and then the whole thing just presses in together. Um, so... It just popped right out, one single piece. So what we're going to do is I'm going to get more of this ink off my hands. And I'm going to cut and I'm going to clean this thing up and I'll come back and we'll re-ink it. And while we're re-inking it, I will measure the volume of the ink and we'll get an idea of how much ink you can put in this thing. Like I said, typically um, when you fill a fountain pen with a like a converter is usually seven tenths of a milliliter, a milliliter of ink. Um, other ones that have different filling mechanisms other than converters will hold more ink, but this is actually um, this is actually a, a pretty good sized body, so that's going to hold a, a lot of ink. So anyhow, we're going to go clean it, we'll come back, and we'll see what happens. So, that was a pretty quick process. One of the nice things about fountain pens is um, fountain pen ink is water soluble, so it doesn't mean that it doesn't stain, and that doesn't mean that it doesn't ruin things, but it is water soluble, so you can at least rinse it out of things and rinse it away. And so, come back in a little bit on our parts. So you can see, looking at the tube. Um, that that whole assembly just is press fit in there. And if you look down in there, you can see there's little stoppers that are going to stop it when it's as far as it, in as it needs to be. Um, there's no cutouts or anything that makes it to where you have to put that in there a certain way. A lot of times on fountain pens, that will be the case. You'll have a, a cutout to where the nib and feed have to be held together and put in there a certain way. But in this one, it's just going to push back in there. And if you look, you can see it's... Uh, just perfectly circular. There's not anything um, odd about it at all in terms of the way it fits in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to ink up and we're going to use an ink syringe. And the only difference between an ink syringe and a normal syringe is that the needles don't have a point on them. So you can't stab yourself with them. You can't inject drugs with them either. You can just use them for ink. That's all they're for. And uh, like I said earlier, we're going to use today uh, Noodler's Black. And this is sort of a an older bottle. You can tell there's not a whole lot in it. It's all stained up and beat up. But uh, good ink, like I said earlier, it's an ink that I use a lot of. And um, so what I'm going to do, uh, these ink syringes are marked with uh, volume just like a normal syringe would be, and these are five milliliter syringes, so it's a, it's a good size for ink. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uptake, actually, make sure I don't mess up my, th my thing here. And I'm going to uptake five mils of ink so that I know what I'm working with. One of the things about fountain pens is you get the ink out. A lot of times you turn the bottle so that it gets down in the corner. And back in the days when people use fountain pens all the time, you'd have ink wells. And the ink wells would do that for you because they would have a little kick in the bottom of them um, so that a, a little volume of ink would give you some good depth. And... Um, if you uh, go out and get an inkwell now, it's probably going to be a reproduction inkwell, a fake inkwell. It's going to have a flat bottom, and it's not actually going to work as an inkwell. Um, but the way around that is to sort of tip the bottle like that. And so this is going to be approximate. I've got about five milliliters of ink in there. It's not going to be exact, but it doesn't need to be exact. And... There's different ways that you could fill this thing. Um, obviously, I use the ink syringe because it's the cleanest way to do it, the easiest way to do it. Um, but you don't have to use an ink syringe. You could just pour it. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go up to right before where it looks like that piece is going to fit back into. So I'm going to go up to about right there. And I just dropped about a milliliter of ink so that's not nearly as the capacity that I thought it was it looked like a lot more than that so anyhow that's about the capacity that you would get out of a if you really really filled a converter really well and so I'm just gonna put my extra ink back in here very carefully carefully as I can So now we've got it inked up. We've got about a milliliter of Noodler's Black in it. And we are going to reverse the process. And hopefully it'll be fairly straightforward. Just push that song bitch right back in there. I left a little bit, I think, of spare room in there because I don't want to uh, push it in there. There not be room for all the ink once I put it in there. Uh, and if we pull this off, I'm going to be impressed. Because then we've got a $3 fountain pen that we can keep using. Um, not that I'm cheap, but, you know, like I said before, that just slides right back in there. And I'm just going to push it till it pops in place with my little gripper. And hopefully I'll hear a nice click or something that'll let me know that I got it in there all the way. Ah. Hmm. Well, no nice click. I think it was recessed further than that. Let's see if we can get it in there a little further. Because they've got machines that can really push that shit in there. Okay, well. So, let's see if it... Okay. It's not leaking. That's cool. So we're just going to try and make sure that we've got good flow. And we'll come in a little bit and come down here. And it may take me a minute to get the, get the feed going. I'm assuming this ink is going to work in this pen. wondering if it's just going to take a little while to saturate and get up into the feed or if I'm going to have to push that thing up in there further because it's really acting like it's not all the way in there.
Ah, there we go. That's the click I was looking for. That's the click I was looking for. So it did take a little bit more effort. That's just as dry as it could be. The ink. You can see it's getting into the feet a little bit. All right, something's happened there a little bit. Really, that gray I'm getting, it's like a little bit of residual water that was in there, mixing with some ink. And now I've got it coming up into the feed some more. So it's acting like you've just really, really, really got to work to get the feed. And just for comparison purposes, this is what that ink should look like right there that's through obviously another pin so I'm gonna put the cap on it and I'm gonna do this oh yeah now if you look you see how far forward I've got that ink in the feed and actually if you look you see I've got ink coming out on the feed. There we go. So I'm going to clean up that little bit of mess that I made there. And now God damn it. So, had a bit of a light issue there. It decided uh, my auxiliary light up here that I'm using to light my work surface decided it didn't want to stay where it was, and it's actually not where it should be right now, so it's probably not lit exactly the way it should be, but good enough it'll work for the moment. So, um, when the lights decided to go their own way, I was talking about um, looking at how well this thing wrote with the Noodler's Black in it, and what I was saying is that... Uh, once I used a bit of centripetal force and got the ink whipped up into the feed and got it to start writing, um, it honestly really could not write better with this ink. I couldn't ask for any better result than what you get with it. Um, and I'm not surprised by that. Uh, like I've said earlier, Noodler's Black is a very well-behaved ink in most pens. It does a really, really good job under most circumstances. So I'm not surprised that it does well. And I'm actually going to say um, this pen with the Noodler's Black in it actually writes significantly smoother than it did with the original ink in it. And that's not an uncommon scenario um, for uh, changing an ink to change the way a pen writes. Uh, different properties of the ink can contribute to that and just in particular and there goes that overhead light the battery shot so I guess we'll see what we get on that but just the fact that the Noodler's Black is perhaps a, uh, a more flowable ink a wetter ink an ink that uh, flows better through a given pen just that will make uh, a, a pen write smoother or feel smoother because you're getting more liquid, more ink going to the tip, and so there's more lubrication there in the writing. So not really surprised to see a difference. Um, so really pleased uh, with what we've seen.
I thought this thing was going to be harder to take apart. In fact, I thought that it was going to be honestly impossible to take apart. I figured they would have it set up to where you couldn't re-ink this thing. Um, for charging three bucks for a fountain pen, it would behoove you, I would think, to make it to where people can't just re-ink it at their whim. But um, their failure to protect their market is our benefit. Um, so if you've got a Pilot Varsity and you like the way it writes, or maybe you want to try a different or better ink in it, or you just don't like throwing things away for no good reason. Um, really, it is obviously straightforward to pop that feed out, uh, refill it, and pop it back in. You're going to need something to grip it to pull the feed out. And you saw when I put it back together, it did take a good bit of force to get it to pop back in there. But there's a big click when you do, so you know um, that you've got it back together again. You need whatever ink you want. Um, depending on the ink, you may get better or worse results. And need you a little ink syringe with the little no-stick needle, and you're in business. And um, so I guess that proves what we wanted to prove. So that went pretty damn well. Having used the pen a bit, it's definitely a smoother rider with the Noodler's Black in it, and there's a few other advantages to the Noodler's Ink as well. Looking at some writing samples through a loop, we see that the Noodler's Ink is significantly more saturated, so it's a much darker black. And it also doesn't feather nearly as much on standard copy paper. That's one thing it's known for, drying fast so it doesn't feather on the cheaper paper. It's also a lot more wash resistant than the Pilot Ink. In fact, it's completely wash proof, and that's one of the things that I really like about it for a daily use ink. The other obvious advantage to Noodler's Black is how little write-through there is. In fact, there's really just some moderate ghosting compared to the Pilot Ink, which actually bleeds through to the other side of the paper. Again, that stems from Noodler's Black being such a fast-drying ink. In fairness, I have to say that the high-grade papers like Rhodia, Clairefontaine, Tomoe River just don't like Noodler's Black worth a damn, but for the quality paper that most of us use on a daily basis, there's just not a better ink than Noodler's Black. And it runs peachy keen in the Varsity once you get it in there. And that's it for this episode. Before you go, if you enjoyed it or if you learned something useful about fountain pens, please take a second and give the video a like. That's an easy way to tell YouTube that you enjoyed the video and that you want to see more like it. Thanks for joining me today, and if you enjoyed it, tell your friends. If your friends don't like it, get new friends. Until next time, Keep those horns up high. Y'all take care. You have been listening to Old Man Metal's music. All material depicted is the intellectual property of the copyright holders. Any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is a goddamn shame. Thank you for joining us. Looking for some new podcasts to listen to? Well, Rat Sound Review Network has plenty of shows to choose from. Like Rat Sound Review, where they discuss the latest rock and metal news, as well as interviews and albums. Album vs. Album, the King Diamond Podcast, with Wayne Noon, Greg Noggle, and sometimes this guy. Smack him a gob! Ralph Vieira is also on our network with the Vieira Vault. There's also Old Man Metal's Musings, where he discusses heavy metal and beer. Music is Life with Lou Mavs. The Right Opinion for Those Who Love Politics. A South Park podcast called Suck My Balls. The Infinite Fringe. A watch-along wrestling show called Beyond Bushido. Ex Stradivarius guitarist, the Timo Tolki podcast. And the great Harry Barnett with I Don't Even Like Podcast and The Laugh Cast. So check out RatSoundReview.com or search Rat Sound Review on YouTube, Podbean, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and more.